Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Improving the School Experiences of LGBTQ Plus Students. Um, my name is Tara. I am the program manager at the Southeast MHTTC. That's the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, if you aren't familiar. And um, if you would mind, um, please introduce yourself in the chat with uh, your name, your location, and your role. Again, I am Tara, and um, I have brown hair, um, blue eyes, pale skin, and I'm wearing a black and white um, shirt. I see some introduc introductions coming into the chat here. Um, while y'all are typing in your names, location, and role, um, I'm going to read a little disclaimer. If we could switch to the next slide, please. Um, so I just want to say that the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So we are funded by SAMHSA, um, and we are required to let you know about that. Can we move to the next slide, please? So I'll give a little overview about who we are. Um, we are the Southeast Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. So we are located in Region 4. Um, and we are housed in Atlanta, Georgia, um, which is also on Muskegee and uh, Creek territory or land. Um, so we're housed in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, and we serve eight states in HHS Region 4, so that includes Alabama, Florida, Georgia, um, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Uh, our Southeast MHTT team is made up of Emory University, Rollins School of Public Health faculty and staff, and our expertise um, is in public health programs, systems, research, and evaluation, and this provides a unique lens through which we can address mental health priorities. Our goal is to accelerate the adoption of evidence-based mental health programs by providing training and technical assistance to Region 4. I can we move on to the next slide, please? So here is a screenshot of our website. Um, feel free to uh, check that out. We've got lots of information, um, including um, this webinar, which will be which is being recorded. Um, and I'm going to pop that in the chat really quick. Uh, and you can also find last week's slide deck, understanding the school experiences of LGBTQ plus students. Um, and we will pop that in the chat as well. Um, so ne next slide, please. Uh, so here is the land acknowledgement. Uh, feel free to read through that. Um, Tara, can I like step in and? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so thanks so much, Tara, for inviting us to present um, on ways in which um, uh, educators, um, school administrators, and others um, could um, improve the, the school um, experience for LGBTQ students. Um, and I just wanted to start with like for each of the speakers to, to introduce themselves um, with their name, pronouns, 
position title and uh, the land acknowledgement, and then also like what Tara was doing, describing herself briefly. So I can start. Um, my name is Nyan Trung. I um, use he, him pronouns. I'm a senior research associate at the um, Glisson Research Institute. I currently reside on the Munsi Lenape land in the Northeast region. I am, um, I'm wearing a light blue collared shirt and I have black hair. Um, I, I'll turn to AT to um, introduce himself. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is A.T. Furuya. I use they, them, and um, theirs pronouns, and I am the Senior Youth Programs Manager at GLSEN. Um, I currently reside on the Kumeyaay, Kumeyaay land in um, what is also known as San Diego, California. Um, and I am wearing a white patterned shirt with some fl uh, flowers on it. I have short brown hair. I'm Asian. Um, and I will pass it over to Erin. Hello everyone, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Aaron Ridings. I use he and they pronouns. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Interim Chief of Staff at GLSEN. I have a black shirt on and a mirror in the background. I have brown hair. I'm here on also on Lenape territory and excited for our conversation today. Eric, do you wanna go ahead and jump in? Sure. My name is Eric Samello. My pronouns are he, him. I am currently residing on the Creek land in Alabama and I'm wearing a dark navy button down. I have short dark hair. I am half Asian and I have a butterfly wall behind me that I made myself. Freddie, if you want to go next. First thing, thanks Eric. Um, hey everyone, my name is Freddie Taharka. I use he, him pronouns. I live in Florida. Um, and I currently reside on Seminole land. Um, I have like dark, uh, like brown, blackish uh, hair, it's curly. Um, I have a Prince poster in the background and like a bookshelf. And um, yeah, and I'm wearing a, a black uh, shirt. Okay, great. So, um, so we wanted to start with a land acknowledgement um, for the various um, departments that we're a part of. Uh, so the GLSEN Research Institute, GLSEN Education and Youth Programs and its staff completed this work while on the ancestral homes of, of the Muncie Lenape. The GLSEN Public Policy Offices are located on the ancestral homes of the Piscataway and the Posh Tank. Uh, to learn more about the indigenous territories on which you reside, you can go to native-land.ca. Uh, um, so some of you may know about GLSEN and some of you may not, but um, it, GLSEN is a leading national education organization focused on ensuring safe schools for all students. We are now 30 years old. We were established in 1990 and, um, and GLSEN envisions a world in which every child learns to respect and accept all people, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. And we seek to develop school climates where difference is valued for the positive contribution it makes to creating a more vibrant and diverse community. We do that through our leading research, uh, educational resources and training, student leadership work, our policy advocacy work at the national, state and local levels, public awareness campaigns and messaging. And we couldn't do um, any of this without our 40 plus state and local chapters who are doing the GLSEN work on the ground. So um, the Glisten Research Institute, uh, for now, it's officially been 20 years um, where, where we've been doing research um, and uh, su uh, supporting the organization's mission by conducting original research on issues on sexual orientation and gender identity and expression in K-12 education, and also through evaluating Glisten programs and initiatives. The um, Research Institute also works with our uh, chapters and student leaders and other safe school advocates who want to conduct local research. We have um, a great tool called the Local School Climate Survey that is based on our national survey that is designed to be used for a uh, school, for your, like if for your school or um, your school district. Um, 
We also um, do evaluation work to document, promote, and improve local programming and efforts. Um, so as you can see below, um, this is a glimpse of our many uh, reports over the past few years. Um, you can see our last school climate report, uh, 2019 National School Climate uh, Survey report on the, um, on the far left. Um, so now I will turn to AT to talk about GLSEN's education and youth programs and GLSEN's National Student Council. Great, thank you, Nan. Um, yeah, so uh, GLSEN's education programs, we provide educator resources. Um, these are free for download. So uh, our Safe Space Kit, if you're familiar or unfamiliar, um, really has strong best practices for bullying and harassment intervention, um, how to support LGBTQ plus students in the classroom on school campus. Um, and again, you can download this for free. You can also order a hard copy that comes with a poster and stickers. I'll talk about the importance of that a little later. Um, and then also we have our Ready, Svet, Respect um, kit, which is uh, geared towards elementary. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to, to uh, join you all today and to talk about uh, the resources that we have to offer and also just be in conversation with folks around best practices, uh, questions that you have. Um, we also offer professional development. So as Nyan said, um, research works with our chapter network. Um, we provide trainings for our chapters um, to then go and do trainings. So we have a training of the trainers where they go and then do trainings for school districts, for educators. They meet um, to, do, to help with consulting work. Um, so our, our chapter network is really robust. And, um, and so that's part of how we um, support them. We also have uh, educator and student engagement opportunities, and I will share those later, uh, mostly around days of actions, uh, ways to participate and um, raise awareness, uh, make LGBTQ plus uh, inclusive curriculum, um, highlight that, make it more visible in your classroom, in your schools, um, or in your practice, wherever you're at. And then um, I'll talk about student leadership, uh, the pieces where students come in to advise and, and um, we take the lead of their um, direction on a lot of our work as well. And so we'll talk about how we um, implement this student-centered um, uh, practice. And then also talk a little bit about LGBTQ plus clubs on campus, the importance of those. And then um, in our local chapters, again, how they're building their SHINE um, LGBTQ plus student leadership program. Next slide. And then, um, so I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit more about the GLSEN National Student Council. Um, this is a really, so our youth are so creative and brilliant and artistic. And um, this was right during the first uh, National Stu Student Council Summit. The very next day, one of our brilliant artist students uh, created this uh, really cool graphic. And I, I, oh, anytime I get to share it, um, I, I try to take that opportunity. Um, we offer different programming um, through the National Student Council, like the GLSEN Bulletin. So these are students who jump on our Instagram Live, have conversation around LGBTQ plus um, uh, stories and topics uh, with other LGBTQ plus identified people. Um, and so this is an opportunity for students to jump in. They can comment, they can ask questions and just sit back and hear from their peers around what's going on. Um, and then we also have the National GSA Leadership Coalition. So this helps students organize their LGBTQ plus clubs on campus. And I will pass it on over to Aaron. Thank you, AT, and thank you, Nian. Our uh, GLSEN's Public Policy Office seeks to advance GLSEN's mission that focuses on LGBTQ plus issues in K-12 education through its engagement with federal, state, and local decision makers. Central to our work is seeking to uphold our organization's values and advance racial, gender, and disability justice. We support the leadership of a network of volunteer chapter policy coordinators from our 44 chapters in states and communities across the country. So just to provide a little bit of preview here, uh, you'll hear from our research institute on findings from our National School Climate Survey. We've been conducting that since 1999, so have built a, a body of knowledge about the experiences of LGBTQ plus students over 20 years. 
Uh, you'll hear, hear more from AT on best practices and very glad to have members of our National Student Council here uh, to share with you today. I'll uh, close out our presentation with some information on policies that support LGBTQ plus students' ability to thrive and reach their full potential. And then we'll uh, close with Q&A and a bit of discussion at the end. Um, thanks, Aaron. So um, I will start off by providing a brief overview of the negative experiences that LGBTQ secondary stu uh, school students face um, based on our most recent national research. Uh, so as Aaron had mentioned, the National School Climate Survey, um, and then this, uh, discuss resources for LGBTQ students, as well as recommendations on how school leaders, education policymakers, and others can help to provide safe learning environments for all students. So oh, before I um, talk about the school climate survey, for those of you who uh, attended last week's uh, webinar that we presented, um, I had presented um, in more detail um, the about like the hostile school climate um, indicators and um, that uh, LGBTQ uh, secondary school students face based on the National School Climate Survey data um, and also like um, the uh, supports and resources that um, help to um, mitigate those, uh, um, ameliorate those, um, the, the negative, um, the negative uh, uh, consequences of, of a hostile school climate. Um, so for those of you who, this is more for those of you who um, weren't at the, the last week's uh, webinar presentation, but also I presented a lot of statistics so, and findings. So this could be good to like refresh your memory. Um, so, okay, so the National School Climate Survey as Aaron uh, uh, mentioned was first conducted in 1999. And at the time there was really no national research on the experiences of LGBTQ students in schools. Um, so um, Glisson realized that we needed the information to demonstrate what students experience nationally when it comes to school experiences, especially with victimization, bullying, uh, name calling, as well as what kinds of supports that they have. So um, we do this survey every two years um, so we, that we can keep current information about LGBTQ students' uh, experiences in school. Um, the report not only looks at incidents of events, uh, what our students, uh, so what are students' experiences in terms of negative indicators, but we also look at the availability and efficacy of recommended interventions. So what are the things that might make a difference in school and then demonstrate how those might be related to an improved school climate for these youth. And we continue to, to be the only national research that specifically focus on LGBTQ youth experience in schools. So here, um, here are all the reports since 1999. Um, and then we welcome the, the most current uh, report, the 2019 National School Climate Survey, which was released um, in October of last year. So the, um, in terms of methods, the study was done online. Uh, we do outreach to students through our constituents, our partner organizations at the national, regional, and local level. Uh, we still uh, really rely on local LGBTQ um, youth groups and programs to try to get the broadest sample of LGBTQ secondary school students in the US. And to further that, since not all, all youth may be connected to LGBTQ related organizations and events, even virtually like through Facebook or by following an organization on Twitter, we also do social media outreach through Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. In terms of the sample, characteristics, the data was collected in the 2018-2019 school year. The results were about, and the results were about that school year. There were 16,713 LGBTQ student responses from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and several U.S. Ter territories. About two-thirds of the sample was white. Um, a little less than a third were students of, uh, of color. About half were cisgender, and about a quarter were transgender. Um, and the average age was 15.5 years. 
So now I'm going to uh, briefly talk about the um, LGBTQ students' direct experiences with harassment and assault, which uh, we collectively refer to as victimization. Um, I talk about this in more detail in last week's um, webinar presentation. So if you want that um, more information, you can you know, refer back to the slides that Tara had mentioned where you can get it, get access to it. Um, so we found that over four in five, 86.3% of LGBTQ students saying that they experienced some form of identity-based harassment or assault in school, such as victimization based on sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender. And you can see in the figure that uh, these are the numbers for verbal harassment based on sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender. And uh, so you can see that harassment based on sexual orientation was the most common form of verbal harassment that students reported in the survey. Um, another type of hostile school climate indicator, aside from um, experiences with victimization, is um, anti-LGBTQ discrimination, which refers to bias against LGBTQ students at the institutional level, whether that is practices from educators and staff or school policies that are discriminatory. So we asked students whether they experienced any of several discriminatory school policies or practices related to their LGBTQ identity. And um, as you can see, um, the bar at the very top of the chart, the majority of LGBTQ students, 59.1%, reported experiencing anti-LGBTQ, um, any form of anti-LGBTQ discriminatory policies or practices at school. Um, we also asked, um, so we asked students several questions about different forms of anti-LGBTQ discrimination that they experienced. The chart um, as you can see, shows three categories of anti-LGBTQ discrimination. Um, so here, the top, at the top, how LGBTQ uh, expression in school is restricted, such as being disciplined for public displays of affection that is not similarly disciplined among their non-LGBTQ peers. A second category, um, or in the middle, um, is limiting LGBTQ content and extracurricular activities or restricting LGBTQ students' participation in these activities, such as preventing students from using the locker room that aligns with their gender identity. And then the third category on the bottom um, of the chart is discrimination that targets students' gender by inform enforcing adherence to traditional gender norms, such as preventing students from using the bathroom that aligns with their gender identity. Um, so, so far, what I've talked about very briefly, of course, is um, how the vast majority of LGBTQ students experience high levels of victimization and anti-LGBTQ discriminatory school practices or policies. Um, so as you can imagine, it's likely that some students could have poor outcomes in school. So we examined the negative mental health impact of a hostile school climate. And we found that anti-LGBTQ victimization and discrimination were both related to poorer psychological well-being. So students who experienced high levels of victimization based on sexual orientation or gender expression, and students who experienced anti-LGBTQ discriminatory school policies and practices um, had greater de depression and lower self-esteem. So, the results and findings described um, that I had described show that schools are not safe spaces for LGBTQ youth, and that has negative effects on their school experiences and on their mental health. So it's important that we also investigate resources to help alleviate that, uh, the hostile school climate, um, and that support that we look into our um, supportive educators, uh, student clubs like Gender and Sexuality Alliances or Gay Straight Alliances. LGBTQ inclusive curricular resources and LGBTQ inclusive policies. Um, overall, we find that students who go to schools with these resources and supports report less negative school experiences, such as fewer experiences with victimization than those who do not go to schools, than, than those who do go to schools with these resources and supports. Um, in addition, um, students, um, in addition, students who have access to these resources and supports at their, um, at their school have better mental health, such as higher self-esteem and lower levels of depression than those who do not have access to these resources and supports. So basically having school resources and supports overall is, um, has positive um, benefits for LGBTQ students. It decreased, uh, it's related to decreased negative school experiences, such as homophobic remarks and improved 
uh, mental health, higher self-esteem, and lower levels of depression. Unfortunately, most LGBTQ students um, do not have access to the resources and supports that create safer, more LGBTQ affirming school environments. And that's what our data unfortunately shows. Um, the most common really reported LGBTQ supportive resources, supportive educators with almost every one of the students in our survey being able to identify at least one supportive staff member. Um, so 97.7%. And 66.3% reported they, that they could identif uh, identify many supportive staff members, which was six or more. The next most common support was student clubs like GSAs with 61.6% .6 of students reporting that they had a GSA at their school. Um, much less common is LGBTQ inclusive curricular resources with just under 20% of students who said that they were taught positive representations of LGBTQ people, history, or events. Uh, for any uh, class, a course or class at their school. And then the least commonly reported re uh, school resource was um, LGBTQ inclusive policies with only 13.5% of students reporting that their school had an anti-bullying policy that included sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. Um, and even fewer students, 10.9% uh, had supportive policies or guidelines supporting trans and non-binary students. So um, some of the um, major takeaways was uh, one, um, as we can all see in general school remains a hostile place for many LGBTQ students. And it still shows that more work needs to be done to ensure safe and affirming schools for all. Um, our findings have also shown that, um, that LGBTQ affirming schools, um, so, um, school supports really can make a difference in school um, and can really improve school climate. So um, there are several steps that educators, student leaders, policymakers, and others, uh, other concerned stakeholders can take to improve school climate for LGBTQ students. Uh, one, it's important to support student clubs such as gender and sexuality alliances to continue to provide staff trainings to staff to increase the negative, uh, to increase the number of supportive educators and staff available to students. Um, as if you remember, it's it's really um, fantastic that um, over 90% of students in the survey had at least one supportive educator. And that we're seeing, uh, and what we're, uh, we're seeing is that students who have more staff, um, it can affect a setting level change. So having more supportive adults both gives them more adults to be there for them as a resource, but also can make a difference at the school level in terms of school level institutional changes. Um, and it's also very important for us to continue to work um, to uh, increase student access to accurate and appropriate information regarding LGBTQ people, history, and events. Um, I didn't talk about this uh, earlier, but we also found that having an LGBTQ inclusive curriculum in schools have historically been low um, because we look at change over time since we look, we do the survey every two years and we ask um, the same, some very similar questions or the same exact questions. So uh, we find that like for LGBTQ inclusive curriculum, um, uh, the, it has been um, historically been low and relatively unchanging over the years. Uh, similarly, we recommend working to ensure that school policies and practices do not discriminate against LGBTQ students, that we enact and implement affirming policies and practices for transgender and non-binary students and to continue to work toward adopting and implementing anti-bullying and harassment policy, policies that enumerate sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression as protected categories. Um, so I wanted to say, talk a little bit about the adopting and implementing of, um, of anti-bullying harassment policies. Um, so there are several states in the country that have an anti-bullying and harassment law that mandates protections based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Um, and that's not always evident when you get down to the school policy. So, and then it's, it's not always evident to the student that they are aware that their policy has those protections in them. So I just want to note that uh, there, uh, the, the importance of implementing these anti-bullying and harassment policies and not just having them in the schools. And if you can remember, if you remember, um, earlier what I was saying um, about supports and uh, school supports and uh, supportive resources that, um, and um, unfortunately like the policy, 
comprehensive policies that uh, enumerate um, uh, sexual orientation, and gender, and gender, gender identity, and gender expression um, actually are, are very low. Um, okay, so now I'm going to turn to uh, my colleague A.T. to discuss best practices. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, you know that information. Um, I what I love about our um, National School Climate Survey is this is all student voices. These are student voices from across the country um, telling us what their experiences are. Um, this data helps us in policy. It helps us in advocacy. So please, please utilize um, the research that is is done and, and the breakdown and how our, our research institute is able to. Um, share what students are saying their experiences are, um, and then also the recommendations. Um, so please, I know data oftentimes is, is definitely uh, an important influencer in being able to uh, make your case that we need to have, uh, you know, inclusive curriculum and protections for LGBTQ plus students. So thank you for sharing that, Nan. Um, can you, next slide. So I am excited to talk about uh, some of the best practices for supporting LGBTQ plus students in schools. Um, uh, Nyan, this, this one's the like automated, the definitions are gonna like slide through. So can you uh, go ahead and, and move through those? Um, so GLSEN's four supports, what we're, uh, what we have built on is based on the National School Climate Survey, as well as um, our connection to educators and students who are reporting. We get questions every single day. Um, and what we're finding is um, uh, we've, we've uh, narrowed this down to four supports that really impact um, schools. And uh, these four supports being uh, foundational um, for schools to have in uh, creating more inclusive schools. So that's uh, comprehensive policies. Um, and now can you can you keep forwarding the the um, the rollout so folks can follow along? Um, thank you. So comprehensive policies um, implement comprehensive anti-bullying, anti-discrimination policy that specifically includes protections based on sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. Um, I'm going to uh, pause on that and let uh, my colleague Aaron will later will be talking about um, comprehensive policies and the importance of that. So I'll go ahead and move on for time's sake. Um, supportive educators. So um, the visibility of having supportive educators is really important for students. Um, it's one of the the most um, like obvious pieces that students share with us. Like, I have support. I have someone I can go to. And when we're navigating support for students who are saying, "I am struggling. I am like I don't want to be in school anymore. I can't go to school anymore." One of the first things we do is help students identify someone on campus who is supportive. Um, and and uh, that educator is oftentimes the person who's advocating for these students, going to administration, um, talking to their colleagues, and doing the the um, piece of um, allyship for these students. Sometimes these educators are also LGBTQ plus, so they're also, you know, um, putting their own um, potential job at risk or feeling like they are now that we have protections for educators. Um, but that also doesn't cover like private schools and stuff. So supportive educators on school campus is um, really important for students to be able to connect to and feel like um, that's like one step into uh, feeling like they belong. Um, the oh, we have questions coming keep the questions coming in and, and um, we'll definitely get to those um, either live uh, typing or um, at the end um, student-led clubs so GSAs gender and sexuality alliances they also may have um, different names besides GSAs if they have to remain more anonymous because more of the students don't feel safe uh, being out or they're afraid their parents might find out or um, you know depending on on the school climate some of them will be called like advocacy clubs or um, um, yeah, like uh, um, inclusion clubs. So there's different names for them. They don't have to be called GSAs. They just typically are called GSAs um, when referring to LGBTQ plus uh, student-led clubs. Um, we also uh, provide a lot of resources and support knowing that GSAs uh, or student LGBTQ student-led clubs are places where students are offering education advocacy, they're, so they're involved in, in types of activism and um, social support. So these are, um, they typically lie within those three categories where students will figure out, hey, we just wanna have lunch together and have a spot where we feel like we can 
take a moment, um, relax, not feel like we're on edge or, or having to protect ourselves all the time. Um, they might, this might be like a social club where it's like, we're just gonna focus on movies and of us having fun because we're in a pandemic and we're in a support, unsupportive environment. And so those, uh, they, the students really define based on the school climate, school by school, um, what the area of focus their, their GSA club um, is about and what, what um, they're offering to the students. And then the last uh, support that um, that Glisten has identified as inclusive curriculum. Um, again, foundation like this is like baseline inclusive curriculum. Having um, I you know I'm I'm thinking back to when I was in high school and um, and what was I learning about LGBTQ plus identities and it it wasn't much. It was um, like our community and our identities were dwindled down to the AIDS um, epidemic, um, and so. What is our um, history? What it, who are we beyond um, just traumas? And how have we been resilient? How has LGBTQ people um, really survived through? I mean, we've been around. Um, trans and non-binary identities are not anything new, and they've showed up in um, in cultures and in countries across the world. Um, and so, being able to let young folks know that you know you are not alone. Um, there is nothing that is um, you know like different. You're not um, this kind. You know, nothing's wrong with you, kind of thing. And I'm thinking about what that would have meant for myself and so many people um, from an older generation to have had that information, like what is wrong with me? And then to have, to see representation in anything and to say like, oh, wow, okay, great. This, I'm not the only one um, who is experiencing this or who has navigated this. And so uh, inclusive curriculum um, being something that really helps folks understand and not just for LGBTQ plus people, but also for the folks that are like, I don't know what, what that means. I'm afraid I'm going to bully. I'm going to harass because they have no idea. There's lack of understanding and education um, around LGBTQ people um, and identities. So um, that is uh, inclusive curriculum actually helps create um, a more inclusive and welcoming school for everybody. Next slide, thanks. Um, so Glisten also offers education webinar series. So these are some examples of previous webinars that we've had. We oftentimes bring in educators, principals, um, count school counselors, uh, folks that uh, mental health prof professionals, um, people from different spectrums to, to come and have a conversation. We do a presentation based on our national school climate survey. And then we have voices of, we, have, we bring students into the conversations to talk about their experiences. So these education webinar series, you can um, go to our website and actually watch some of these. They're all recorded and then we upload them to our website um, in case you miss it. But um, you can also sign up on our website to, um, to receive information on when these webinars are coming out. And we also promote them on our social media channels. So that's another um, option to make sure you don't miss the next one. Um, but they're they're uh, pretty in depth. Um, and again, they're very uh, specific and focused on um, what these different components of, of how and experiences of LGBTQ plus students. Next slide. Um, and so Glisten's Days of Actions, I love this part because these are student-led um, campaigns. Uh, we, Glisten holds um, Ally Week, or it used to be called Ally Week, now it's been um, changed to Solidarity Week, where we help students um, really learn the importance of collaborative movement building. So if we're working towards a goal, we're trying to say, hey, we want more inclusion, we want more um, support, uh, actually helping students learn what it what it means to um, work with other uh, other folks of other identities. How are we showing up for each other? And um, what does that solidarity look like? How, what are the best practices? So helping students at a very young age understand the power of collaborative movement building is really important, um, especially as like that is a, another tool of, hey, come and teach our LGBTQ club about what your club does um, and vice versa. And it helps um, build that allyship, build that solidarity work um, so that, you know, as we're seeing so many issues um, come out right now, I'm thinking and what I'm holding in my heart right now um, are the victims in Georgia, the um, Asian women that were targeted in um, white terrorism. 
um, and thinking about how um, Asian solidarity has also worked, um, you know, how Asians and, and the Black community have shown up in solidarity to fight white supremacy, um, among other identities, and how, um, you know, this is an important piece for LGBTQ plus students to learn too, that um, there are a lot of intersecting identities that their peers are holding. And so how do we continue to movement build in that way? Um, no Name Calling Week is another uh, program that we offer where uh, we, we raise awareness around the name calling, um, slurs, uh, bullying and harassment towards LGBTQ plus students. Um, it is mostly geared towards elementary school, although we have everyone participates in this and it's a week long campaign with just a lot of uh, focus on kindness and action. And what does that mean? What, how do we empower students to like, don't call me this name, this is who I am. Um, and, and this is an empowering word or um, identity for me. And then Day of Silence, actually a lot of folks probably are most familiar with the Day of Silence. Um, this is GLSEN's longest campaign um, program. It's actually uh, folks from across the world participate in it. This year it's April 23rd. So we're, we're in a deep getting, rid of, getting re ready for the launch um, that's coming up soon at the beginning of April. And the Day of Silence is a day where um, it's a form of direct action where folks can, um, students, educators, people in our networks can uh, take a vow of silence to raise awareness around around the erasure and silencing of LGBTQ students. That erasure and silencing shows up in not having inclusive curriculum, not allowing GSAs on campus, um, you know, punitive discipline that our students are experiencing that pushes them out of school. Um, and so Day of Silence really is an opportunity for, for uh, students to say, I'm, I'm not, normally I'm silenced, normally I'm erased, Today I'm choosing to be silent um, and, and this is the impact and this. And so a lot of kids are like, why are you being silent today? And then we have um, graphics and information that people can share. I am silent because um, you know, nine and 10 students are, are uh, LGBTQ plus students are pushed out or silenced and erased at school. So um, the date is April 23rd. Um, and uh, I'll make sure to share uh, our, our release information on Day of Silence if folks wanna um, participate, if your organization wants to participate in our days of actions as well. I'm happy to share that and to um, help facilitate any support or conversations y'all might have. Um, and then we follow that the, after the Day of Silence, it's a moment of reclaiming um, their voices, of uh, lifting up their identities. And so we have a Breaking the Silence rally um, at the end of the day where we can come together, break that silence, celebrate who we are. And um, it's a really amazing time for students to come together and also like, um, you know, connect with each other, especially during the pandemic. Um, next slide. Oh, um, hmm? AP, I just wanted to add that um, on the day of silence, we're also launching our uh, 2021 National School Climate Survey. Um, so it's part of this whole day of silence, but breaking the silence. Um, so like it's kind of like a call to action where LGBTQ students in um, participating in the um, survey, they're actually they're talk they're speaking up about their stories. And Thank you so much for that reminder, Nyan. Um, yes, and our theme this year is, is uh, my silence, my story. Um, so uh, moving them into action. So that's the other part is um, these are all ways to help. I mean, most young people, LGBTQ plus students, um, you know, this, this may be their first time engaging in a direct action or in um, organizing or in advocacy work. And so we want to uh, make sure that we're equipping them with, um, you know, thank you for participating in this and here's what's next. Here's what we can do. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thank you for jumping in on that. Can you, uh, next slide. Um, we also offer uh, GLSEN student and educator engagement. Um, so some of the fun stuff, because I know this work can be heavy. I know it could be taxing, um, you know, a lot of folks experiencing burnout. Um, and so what we also like to offer are moments of, um, of joy and just like getting together and relaxing and having, you know, these like having conversations. Um, uh, Glisten is lucky enough to partner with folks like Netflix and Hulu on um, some of their, their LGBTQ uh, young adult um, high school focused um, movies and films or TV shows. And uh, we create discussion guides with the students. Um, and so folks 
anyone can participate whether you actually watch the film or not the questions are designed in such a way um is to bring up like you know how are we navigating this what does support look like what can we do on our campus for so um we we also offer these guides as uh, students are are in um, taking in uh, different forms of media next slide so um, supports for LGBTQ plus inclusion, um, you know, again, I think this is really like what we're getting at and what folks are showing up to these um, webinars for is like, what do we do um, on the day to day? What can we do now? Um, and so I'll go over some of these. I have a couple slides on um, best practices and um, supports for LGBTQ plus inclusion. So we'll start with encourage professional development for educators that specifically focuses on LGBTQ plus students, educators, and families. Um, uh, interrupting anti-LGBTQ plus comments, harmful gender stereotype, reinforcement, LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum. Um, and I will say uh, a lot of our work focuses on prevention. Um, so we have prevent uh, resources that are like, here's how to, to establish a safe and inclusive classroom where students know that harmful language is not acceptable. And then also we um, offer resources for if something happens, how do I deal with that? How do I identify and understand that something harmful is happening in the moment? And so we offer those resources. We encourage, um, again, reaching out through our chapter network on um, professional development trainings. And you know that's not just limited to educators. You can ask our chapter network um, to also, like, what does it mean to have a conversation with students about this? What what does restorative practices look like for LGBTQ plus students? Um, and then also support for families, um, bringing them in to um, also receive these uh, trainings around identity, how to show up for your kids, um, and then interrupting the interrupting anti LGBTQ plus comments again, um, that awareness like if you go through a professional development, you may learn things that you hadn't known before, like, oh, I didn't realize that was a slur oh, I didn't realize that, um, you know, when students are making these comments that it, it, it impacts, you know, folks in their environment. And I just didn't know how to disrupt that. I'm not like, I think what I hear oftentimes from from adults is, um, well, I'm not an expert on trans identities. So I don't know if, what if I interrupt and tell them that that's not okay. And then they ask me more questions and I don't know how to answer that. So I think that's where um, PD is really helpful for everyone um, to understand that you don't have to be an expert to stop bullying and harassment. Um, and that like how we can equip you and help you uh, navigate that and talk just about, talk about harm and talk about um, safety. And so communicate a commitment to LGBTQ plus diversity, equity, inclusion that is visible to students, educators, and families. This may be a poster. This may be your policy. Again, Erin will talk more about the policy piece. But um, how is the communication being delivered to folks to say this school does not tolerate homophobia, transphobia, racism, xenophobia, like X, Y, Z? How, how, what are the visible signs that say, you know, all are welcome here? Um, and this is what that means for our school and, and our community and how, and here are commitments to also supporting these folks thrive. Um, read and share GLSEN's policy recommendations for district and school leaders, promote GLSEN's days of actions. So as I just shared the different types of days of actions and how you can participate, um, you know, it's pretty amazing when educators are also like, I know my students are participating in day of silence. I would like to, I'm an educator. I don't know how to teach a whole day in silence. Guess what? We've got resources for you. Um, so, you know, just being able to uh, meet the needs of folks and how to really equip educators, adults who, who are supporting LGBTQ plus students. Um, read GLSEN's National School Climate Survey. Um, again, Jan just shared a lot of slides and information. Um, I've definitely combed through it. And um, again, the information that, that it tells me students are saying, here is a major gap that's happening. Here's where I'm feeling harm the most. And then that informs us to then build our resources. And you can use the National School Climate Survey in the same way, um, you know, and especially our state snapshots. If you're living in a state where 
be like, I don't know what, I don't know what the policies are. I don't know what students are experiencing in my state. Um, you know, check our website and you can see like, oh, okay, I noticed that in, um, I think I saw a bunch of folks from Kentucky, for example, um, here's the experience and that may be very different than folks and what they're reporting in California. And so having that specific information also um, can be helpful to even narrow down more of, of your priorities on how to support students. Um, next slide. Support for coming out. This is really important because a lot of folks are like, uh, what do I do? I have a suspicion that a kid may be LGBTQ+. Um, do I confront them about it? Um, what if they come out to me? I have no idea how to support them. And so we actually have resources on um, supporting LGBTQ plus students coming out or exploring their identity. And um, what I will say first to the comment that I made is, um, if you suspect that a student may be LGBTQ plus and is looking to come out, do not um, confront them and ask them if they're LGBTQ+. That is not best practice. Um, I, when I work with students, I, I've worked in drop-in centers. I have students come in as allies and they're, you know, I don't make assumptions. I take students for their word as if they say, I am this identity. Okay, you're that, that, that is how you identify. And um, I honor that, that's who you are. And unless they tell me otherwise, I really um, have to uh, reinforce that practice of not assuming. So um, if a student, if I'm, you know, if I'm, uh, what I often get from teachers is like, well, but I wanna be supportive and I want that student to know that I'm here and they can tell me. And the intention is um, beautiful. Like, I love that. I'm, I love that folks want to show up for students and let them know you may be hurting right now, but I'm here for you. Ways that you can show that is by having stuff like safe, safe, safe space stickers in the background, um, in your, your office area, in the classroom, um, anywhere that's visible. Um, for me, as a non-binary trans person um, who's also queer, the first thing I do when I enter a space is I'm thinking about my safety. Um, I am someone who has experienced um, trauma, violence, um, transphobia, you know, any, like a lot of things, you name it, I've experienced it. And so um, as someone who uh, moves throughout this world as a trans person who's visibly seen as a trans person, the things I look for are my indicators of um, you know, are your pronouns in your signature? Are, um, when I walk in, is there some sort of indicator that this is a, a safe and inclusive space for folks or that that's on your radar? Um, I have like my decorate, my uh, flags and my art and stuff because um, I work with students and I want them to know um, that, uh, you know, this is a non judgmental space that I'm here to support you and wh whatever that looks like for you. Um, so that is really. And I will say too, the way when I was coming out, just from my experience, and we can hear from Freddie and um, and Eric as well, is uh, I was thinking about that. Like, who of my friends do I know um, do advocacy work for LGBTQ plus folks? Who who am I safe to disclose um, such important and vulnerable information with? And so, um, and that was I chose that based on behaviors. I chose that based on what I know this person's about. And so you can um, still let all students know, all folks in your community and spaces know that you are a safe person to talk to based on, um, you know, how you're showing up uh, without having to confront someone and ask them if, if uh, how they identify in that way. Um, respect your students' privacy, um, allow them to decide when to come out. So is what I just shared. Also, um, when a student discloses their identity to you, respond in an affirming, supportive way. Um, also, when I like came out to my mom, for example, I knew she was gonna be supportive, but I was also holding that, what if she's not kind of devastation where I was like, hey, so, and then I shared with my mom and her response was, I love you and I, you know, I'm, I uh, respect you and I'm here to support you. What do you need from me? And that was such a moment of like relief. And so I'm thinking of, um, you know, even if, if you're like, well, they should know that I'm going to be supportive, just telling them that, you know, I'm supportive of you. Uh, what can I do to show up uh, is, is a better response than, are you sure? I've, I've worked with um, students and therapists who have told students um, and mental health providers, are you sure you're LGBTQ plus? Like, how do you know for sure? Um, uh, you know, maybe it's better if you're not because, you know, it sounds like you have a lot of uh, people who are not accepting. And so, you know, um, that, that kind of response is actually really detrimental to um, LGBTQ plus students. 
Um, students are their own expert. Again, I take them at their word. If they tell me they're this identity, um, you know, you have to be aware of how biphobia um, works in our communities when a student comes out as bi and then the questions are like, are you sure you're bi? Does that mean you're really X, Y, Z? Um, and so again, take students at their, at their word. Um, you know, bi identities are valid and, um, and we, it's not for anyone else to decide uh, whether someone is or isn't, it's up to that one, that individual. Um, use the name and pronouns, um, he, she, they, your students, uh, whatever they prefer um, or whatever pronouns they use for themselves. Um, if you're unsure, ask and make sure that you're not asking the one kid or the one person who you think might be trans. Um, that should just be a, a normalized practice for everybody. If I'm, um, because I, it's very obvious to me when I'm in a room and someone only asks me my pronouns and they don't ask everyone else, I'm kind of like, okay, uh, I clearly was, uh, you know, and, and again, I think the intentions are good, but the impact is not as well received um, by folks like myself who are like, you should be asking everybody that and not assuming folks as pronouns. Um, don't assume what worked for one student will work for another. This is really important. If a student comes out to you or is um, maybe they're not coming, they're just navigating their LGBTQ plus identity. Um, do not assume that what works for one student will work for the other. Um, I've worked with students who are like, okay, and they're in elementary school. Um, I'm going by the same in pronouns. Um, and I would like to give a presentation on my identity. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. And the, working with the, the educators and the principals to um, support that student in this, this presentation. Some students are very low key and they're just like, just, I don't want an announcement. I just want my teachers to know and to just start using my name and pronouns. Um, so it really depends on the student, um, you know, uh, having a student explain or putting them on the spot uh, may be very terrifying for them. So always take the student's lead on how they want to, um, you know, share their identity in any capacity. Um, yeah. And then um, hold an open, honest space where each individual student can guide their own journey with your support. So if a student's like, hey, I'm identifying as LGBTQ+, and they share, um, you know, what their identity is, um, building up that support space. I often will sit down and I'm like, okay, so let's identify that, that um, uh, supportive educator or adult on your campus. Identify friends that you have that if, you know, you're worried about this class period and, and harassment and bullying, um, who do you have that can have your back and support you or go to the, your bathroom buddy or, you know, like always thinking about safety is the central part to anything moving forward. It's not just like, hey, there's a parade, pride parade, let's go and show up. It's literally what will make you safe right now and how can we build out that safety support? Um, I find that students often will rely on one person. Um, and so then that one person is holding a lot of what the students experience is. And I like to build out that support um, so that it's not relying on one person who's most likely not doesn't know a lot more about support and and, um, and just giving that student options so they can go to other folks um, for different needs, counselors, educators, um, you know, their peer support. So always trying to build that out, family support. Um, if a family is supportive of their LGBTQ plus student, that is also the, the second most important, I focus on safety. And then my second question is, do you have a supportive uh, home? Do you have a, a supportive family, guardian, um, caregiver? Um, and then sit uh, in siblings. Um, so thinking about, um, because when it comes to school and protection, um, families that are supportive will show up and will, and, and honestly are um, the most influential folks. I show up as a community support. So I'll be like an advocate for the family, um, but really it's, it's the, the family who's supportive saying, these are the things I'm expecting the school to deliver for my child in order for my child to be safe. Um, we know that students who are not who don't feel safe at school cannot learn. Um, so how do we make sure to build that for everybody? Next slide. Um, okay, so I know I've taken up a lot of time and I wanna make sure I'm, I'm able to pass information over to my colleague, Aaron. Um, and so folks on um, here, we're gonna be sharing uh, we're gonna be sharing these slides out again, like we did with the last presentation. Um, and also I covered most of this. So that's, um, you know, supporting GSAs on campus, um, keep learning about LGBTQ plus identities. Like that's your homework um, to read articles, to um, check out GLSEN's website on our best practices, um, model policies, 
uh, the National School Climate Survey. Um, and then also, um, uh, let's see, the other one was uh, connecting students with LGBTQ plus uh, presenters, organ organizations, resources. So GLSEN's one of many LGBTQ national organizations that offer different types of support to, to LGBTQ plus students. Um, so always keeping in, in mind what are the resources these folks need? Um, how can I co uh, collaborate and connect with uh, folks in community, like in your immediate space, um, your city, your state who are doing advocacy work, um, who, and then also who you can connect them to. Is there an LGBTQ plus drop-in center um, or center that offers free mental health care for, for LGBTQ plus students should they need it? Um, so these are some more of the best practices. And then I, next slide. And then I'm gonna ask, okay, cool. Uh, so this is also my favorite part because I get to speak with two um, astounding young people, um, Freddie and Eric, who had uh, introduced themselves earlier. Um, Eric is from Alabama and Freddie is from Florida. Um, so if you all wanna um, uh, go ahead and, and join us in this call right now, I have a couple questions to kick off um, before uh, we pass it over to Aaron. Hey. <laughs> so my question to you, just to uh, get some of these conversations going, especially before the Q&A, is um, what has helped improve your school experience as an LGBTQ plus student? And if we can start with Freddie this time. Sure. Um, thank you for that, E.T. Uh, <laughs> so um, so I, uh, I think that um, having that support from the, you know, administration of my school um, and knowing that, like, it's a safe space and, you know, wherever I'm going in the classroom, um, wherever classroom I'm going to, knowing that it's a safe space and, like, seeing a, you know, a visible, like, uh, like a flag or just something, knowing that, you know, um, I'm, it's okay, you know, to, to be myself. And um, validity is something that I, like, I love hearing that, like knowing that you know I'm empowered to be myself. And so anytime a teacher or just someone would say that, hey, you're valid. And so like I know that myself, but also it's just nice to, you know, get that like from another person and um knowing that, you know, I'm appreciated for being who I am and it's okay. Um so that's kind of what it's you know, me however I choose to, you know, represent who I am. Um, and in school, that that's fine, you know. So, yeah, I I agree. Um, one of the one of my favorite things that one of my teachers does. She's the she's the advisor for our GSA, and she has a giant poster in the window of her classroom that says "Teacher Ally" that she wrote herself with big black Expo marker and has a little rainbow heart underneath it, and. I, I love her so much. And that's just, it's just seeing something like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be a giant display, even just like a sticker. And I remember the first year I started my GSA at my school, we had a couple little flags and one of the teachers was walking by and she said, oh, can I have one of those? And she, she's a cishet woman, but she just wanted to put it in the pen holder in her classroom so kids in there would know that her room was a safe place. And that, that that tiny little question that one interaction made like my month that was just such a, a just very small simple things i think i've also been lucky enough to have a principal who is supportive of the community so in all of my endeavors working with the gsa trying to get things done I, I, it's never been the administration's never been a problem and that's for alabama thank god it's been, it could have things could have been a lot more difficult in that regard but one of the things that just makes me feel the most safe is when my identity is just completely i don't want to say ignored but it's a non-factor because we're trying to get a quality and normalization of all these things all these identities the community insists in all of society and there's nothing that makes me feel more normal than when I might say I'm gay or something, or I'll do something. And it's just, it's not even considered. No one mentions it. No one's, no one addresses it. It's just, oh, cool. And then keeps moving on. Like when I first came out to my mom and she, I, she knew I had a crush on someone, she didn't know who, and I didn't want to tell her. And she looked at me and said, is it a boy? And I, 
how it is. And she goes, oh, thank God. I thought it was going to be something bad. And it was just something, something very minor like that, that just, it's just not a, it's just not a big deal. That's what, that's something that really makes me feel safe. ET, you're muted. Oh my God, these continue. I've been on uh, Zoom for, I mean, all of us have been on Zoom for at least a year and, and I, I can't be the only one who's still making those muted mistakes. Um, but I, I appreciate you saying that, Eric, because I think also uh, LGBTQ plus students are often the um, ones wearing the cape at school. They're oftentimes the ones having to be the educators, be the token LGBTQ representation um, at school, be the ones who are pushing for advocacy. And I love the students that are like, let's do it. And we're gonna, you know, hold these demonstrations and we're gonna push for this. Like, yes, always supporting that, always supporting youth voices, but also like they shouldn't have to, like that is such a burden on top of going to school, on top of everything else. And so I'm just thinking about um, and, and naming Eric as, as you're like, yeah, I just want to show up to school and and be who I am, and that not also uh, always be the central part of conversations of like I have other things going on in my in my life and and things that I enjoy and pieces of who I am that that aren't just um, being LGBTQ plus. So um, I just want to like name that and thank you for sharing that too. And then my second question before we pass it on over to Aaron is um, uh, dreaming of a school space where you can thrive. What does that look like? Like if you were to have the ultimate school experience um, without any, with or without things, what would that look like? Ready, is it cool if I go first this time? Okay, um, well, seeing as I do live in Alabama and I am a product of the public education system in Alabama, there are a lot of things I would like to see, lots of progress I would like to see get made. And I think our friend Jaden, who's also on the National Student Council, lives in Southern California. And when he describes his school environment to us, it just seems like a utopia of like, oh, we had to go to, we had to go to um, like ancestral indigenous lands and learn about indigenous culture from indigenous people. We had comprehensive sex ed that was inclusive of queer people. And we learned about queer figures in history and I'm over here like reading propaganda history books that are trying to tell us that America is the number one country in the world. And it just, there's such a drastic difference there. But if I had to model something that I think would be the ideal school experience, it would probably be a school like that, where everyone and every, like no one feels neglected and history is accurately portrayed the way it happened. It's, they're, first of all, just comprehensive sex ed in general, because I am, I'm in Alabama, and they're like, if you look at someone else lustfully, you're going to die immediately. Lightning's going to strike you down, and you will die. That's, that's kind of the gist of it. Much less, any mention of queer people is just is non-existent. But I, that would just, that would really be ideal, I think. And, and I, I, I don't know if this might be a little controversial, but I feel like maybe a school. Our ultimate ideal is not needing a GSA. There's no need for a space specifically dedicated for queer people or because everywhere is safe and every, everyone everywhere can just be happy and do what they want to do. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree with that. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, in terms of like the inclusive curriculum, I think that's kind of uh, a big, part of it, you know, and um, I always have to bring this up because like, like I want to be, you know, a, sorry, my computer's being right. Um, yeah, I want to be, you know, an educator. I want to be um, a social studies teacher. And so you know, now in like the social studies classes, like it's rarely, you know, I, I can't say I've had that being talked about other than, you know, um, a, a mention of the AIDS, um, you know, epidemic, but other than that, it's it's just about focusing around that trauma, but even it's not even in depth with it and other you know micro well, things and how that has affected you know like and throughout history. So I think as a space as a whole, um, what it would look like is like just it includes you know it's already it's always talked about why we wouldn't need 
um, the DSA, like Eric was saying, um, because it's already there, you know, and, um, you know, having the bathrooms in inclusive, I wouldn't have to, you know, even though I am a, a cis dude, I still, I like, I remember when I was in Europe, um, I, that was the first time I came across um, a junior neutral bathroom and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like, um, I loved it. And this, I, I thought that was amazing. And um, so I would love if there's, you know, ev everywhere is that, you know? And I think in also just when teachers are doing questions, um, I want to see, you know, not just the he or she, like I, I hate when I see this, that, the non, but the binary um, and not other or, you know, and um, yeah, so that's it, it, what, what it looks like is like um, everything's already considered. It's no like one's left out and um, it's already part of the mainstream. Yes. So. Yeah, definitely. Thank you both for um, your responses to that. Uh, I have like so many ideas like going in my head too. I'm like, I have more questions and I'm sure other folks uh, on the call do as well. And and so we'll have a moment for q and I want to go ahead and pass it on over to Aaron. So again, um, as questions, I'm going to jump in and answer some, jump in to respond to some of these questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'll pass it on over to Aaron. Thank you, A.T. Thank you, Eric and Freddie. Um, I think as, as you might have heard, the National Student Council, our Educator Advisory Network, and our chapters across the country are at the heart of GLSEN's work and our ability to advance our mission. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, reach out to A.T., reach out to the team, and um, you know, think about ways uh, to engage with our networks uh, to support and strengthen your programs. I want to highlight uh, just briefly so that we have some time uh, for Q&A and discussion, some important developments related uh, to the transition uh, to the new administration. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. So during uh, the first week, uh, immediately after Inauguration Day, President Biden issued an important executive order on combating uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, some of you on this call uh, might have remembered last June, uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. The primary holding found that discrimination based on sex includes sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, a number of departments, including HUD um, and other federal agencies have already issued directives implementing uh, this executive, executive order uh, so would encourage you to keep an eye out for additional um, guidances and procedures for implementing uh, these non-discrimination protections within your work. Uh, also important is the uh, executive order that was issued on racial equity. It enumerates uh, all marginalized communities within the scope of the order that includes LGBTQ plus communities. So within that federal framework, they are establishing an interagency working group on data collection uh, to take a closer look at survey design and how to make that more comprehensive. Uh, it prioritizes uh, engagement and collaboration with impacted communities uh, that should and could include LGBTQ plus young people. It also establishes a process for federal agencies, all the different departments, uh, to do an equity assessment and then use that information to strengthen their organizations and programs. Go to the next slide. So over the past year, uh, I think it was March 12th uh, when GLSEN, our workforce went remote and many in our, in our networks went remote as well. Um, it's important to name that LGBTQ plus young people uh, particularly those who are transgender, non-binary, Black, Indigenous, people of color, people with disabilities have been uniquely impacted by the twin pandemics, COVID-19 and our nation's uh, reckoning with systemic racism. In the process of uh, doing public education on what types of funding priorities would be most um, affirming and supportive of LGBTQ plus young people, uh, we shared the following information. And I think, you know, after the CARES Act passed uh, last week, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 uh, was signed by the president, 
we're really encouraged to see when state and local decision makers, uh, program leaders make decisions uh, to hire additional staff who can provide mental health support, school counselors, uh, build in uh, social emotional learning supports, particularly during this time of mass disruption and trauma. Also and equally encouraging uh, when program staff and others make the decision uh, to purchase culturally affirming professional development services. Thinking about the different types of program areas uh, that, that are within your focus, um, we're happy to, to make some recommendations, give some thought to uh, the types of professional development that would really allow you and your teams uh, to better serve LGBTQ young people uh, within your uh, areas of service. So we can go to the next slide. So under these uh, supportive federal guidelines and investments, uh, there are often opportunities in the process of implementation uh, to identify uh, community partners uh, to collaborate with to make programs stronger and to improve outcomes for LGBTQ plus young people. So as I mentioned before, we have 44 chapters across the country and we have volunteers who conduct professional development training. If you look at your service area within a state or a locality, uh, would be happy to help uh, make a scan and identify um, additional partners uh, in this important work. LGBTQ plus community centers Service providers are often available to provide technical assistance that can ultimately improve outcomes and get the results uh, that we'd like to see. Also want to lift up uh, some other national partners, uh, Trevor Project, PFLAG, True Colors United, who are also uh, available and very good resources on strengthening programs and outcomes. So I want to leave uh, the balance of the time for uh, question, answer, and discussion. And thank you again for the opportunity uh, to join you today. Um, so I guess I can jo uh, jump in. Like one of the questions is, are there other national organizations that are working to ensure that out of school time organizations and spaces are safe and affirming? Like, YMCA, Boys and Girls Clubs, Fort H, et cetera. So um, I, I, there are, so like, um, I think that, that um, uh, Aaron had, had mentioned a few of them, like Trevor Project um, and PFLAG, but I'm also thinking um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, which we also, we partner with them. Um, and uh, so they are also another national organization that 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 has that provides spaces that are safe and affirming for LGBTQ uh, students. Um, are there any others that you can think of, AT or Aaron? Yeah, actually, what what's great about this question is, um, like, I appreciate Aaron had shared national organizations that focus on LGBTQ plus support, um, and so naming that um, the like the YMCA Boys and Girls Club, those organizations um, have partnered, and and we've actually provided trainings for their national staff um, and volunteers, and so um, something that's great is um, they're also looking into building out like GSA type of after school programs or spaces in places like the YMCA um, so that students who are not out at home may say like, hey, I'm going to the YMCA or I'm going to the Boys and Girls Club with that with like their um, being privacy and um, an anonymity around why they're going to that space. Um, libraries are also another um, space where LGBTQ students are organizing because they get free Wi-Fi, they have book access, there are rooms that they can check out um, and organize there. And um, oftentimes librarians are working to ensure that there's LGBTQ plus books available that are oftentimes not available at the schools. Um, so yeah, uh, there are a lot of community-based organizations um, and, and lo locations that are not specifically LGBTQ+, um, but that are being inclusive and are um, strategic areas for folks to, to organize, to gather, to, um, to go to. Um, another question is, are parents resistant to these ideas 
and student-led meetings. Does anybody want to um, jump in for this question? I could say I could say a bit if that's cool with everyone. Um, I know uh, it it does depend a lot on the environment, what kind of state you live in, what your city's like. I mean, I do live in Alabama, but I live in one of the more liberal areas of Alabama. So, um, I mean, there there was some pushback. Some parents weren't happy. Some of them didn't want their kids to be going to a school with a gay club. I guess they were afraid that they could be walking past a classroom that was playing Britney Spears too loudly and their kid would all of a sudden, you know, become gay magically because it's an airborne pathogen. But um, it there might be some resistance from parents. And the way that I got around that was not explicitly labeling, labeling my club as a gay club instead of calling it, not a gay club, but a GSA, but instead of calling it an overarching social justice group that had the umbrella where you could address LGBTQ issues within that. So it wouldn't be as obvious, especially to people who are out to their parents. They could say, oh, I'm joining this club because I wanna focus on maybe like race related issues or gender issues, but maybe not necessarily specifically LGBTQ issues, but they can do that as well. And, and, and there was enough pushback to where it was difficult to get the administration to get mine started. But if you, you can, there, can, there can be ways to work around parental disapproval. You just kind of have to be willing to bend a lot of things. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thanks. Um, another question that came in was, um, and maybe AT, you could uh, jump in here. How would you recommend to have that conversation with other students if the student wants? Can you give examples of language to use with kids to explain? Um, I'm, I'm guessing this is, uh, how would you recommend to have conversations with other students around like a student coming out? Um, is what I'm guessing this is about. Can you have examples of language to use with kids to explain? Um, or do you mean um, like talking about LGBTQ plus identities? It just was uh, some clarification on uh, if that question came up while I was presenting, or I, I think I'm looking at the time, I think I was. So I'm gonna assume it's about coming out um, just based on the time and when I was speaking. Um, uh, yeah, so how would you recommend to have this conversation with other students? Um, so again, uh, based on the student led, uh, like what the student says they're comfortable with, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, again, this shouldn't come up just because a student's coming out, but if you're building, we're talking about prevention and you're building safe and inclusive classrooms, um, that you're already having these conversations and not waiting or not assuming that you don't have students. Um, I think a, a big error that adults make is, well, we don't have LGBTQ students at our school or they're not in my classroom. Um, and, and uh, you know, we've, we've been in your classrooms, <laughs> you've known it or not. Uh, and so um, not making that assumption that I don't have to address these things because to my knowledge, like don't wait for someone to have to come out in order to start building that inclusive classroom. Um, and so I would also just recommend uh, that again, looking at ways in your curriculum, how can you insert LGBTQ plus identities as an introduction, um, how can you add that to your syllabus um, or like the package that you send home that this is a safe and inclusive classroom for all students. That means, um, you know, enlisting that out, especially the students that you know are targeted, um, specifically targeted the most in your communities, because um, that's also going to change based on um, environment. And so uh, making sure to center those voices um, and letting folks know that I am a teacher who, um, you know, believes in safe and inclusion for everyone. And if these students who are the most impacted by systemic um, oppression, um, if I am supporting them, I'm supporting everybody. Like that includes everyone else um, as well. So um, yeah, uh, complete the, okay, sorry, that was the evaluation. Um, I hope that was helpful um, uh, because that, that also can be tricky. Like, do I just go into class one day and say, 
hey folks, here's what LGBTQ plus means. I think it's really like thinking about the appropriate places that you can start um, inclu including these things. If you're talking about history, how can you um, also incorporate LGBTQ plus folks, we have inclusive curriculum resources on our website, um, you know, for uh, different um, subjects. I mean, even math, like you can talk about um, how to have inclusive curriculum in math class as well. If it's problem solving, how can you talk about like incorporate LGBTQ identities there? Um, so there's just so many different ways that you can introduce that, that where you're not waiting for that one kid to come out. Another question, um, I think it's also best practice um, type question is, uh, in a middle school, is being offered an alternative restroom, for example, the nurse's restroom, considered anti-trans? Um, this is a tough question uh, because even in states where um, LGBT or trans and non-binary students are allowed to use, like there are bills that actually say you you can use the bathroom that aligns with your identity. Um, when there's only one bathroom available and it's the nurses, what has happened um, over the last, you know, I don't know, five to six years since more people have engaging have been engaging in inclusive facilities is that the nurse's bathroom does become the trans bathroom um, because it's the only facility on campus that um, where there's privacy, like a, a, a single stall restroom. Um, and so the problem with this and why it could be seen as anti-trans is if you like, you know, some of these school campuses are very large. And if you have uh, X amount of time in passing period and the only restroom you can use is on the other side of campus, and then you have to take off to the other side of campus after your students are showing up to class late. Um, they're on um, that or they're not hydrating because uh, they don't want to have to deal with the bathroom issue. So this is actually like also a um, public health issue. This is a, an issue on students' bodies and their their health and well-being. So um, yeah, that it can be seen as um, if the, the nurse's station is the only place that has a single stall restroom that's safe for any student to access. Um, I also just want to say that gender neutral restrooms um, and bathroom access isn't just about uh, just about trans and non-binary students. A lot of victimization um, and bullying and harassment happens to um, uh, students who are LGBTQ plus um, identities as well. And so thinking about how bathrooms are often the place like um, LGBTQ students and people are demonized um, around bathroom issues, but it's actually LGBTQ people who are experiencing violence and assaults in these restrooms by non-LGBTQ plus people. So um, I just want to like make that clear and as a, a targeted space to make sure that, you know, again, signage, um, uh, normalizing these like, hey, this behavior is not okay, um, checking in on coming up with safety plans, um, that the, all of those steps will be helpful um, in navigating bathroom access for, for all students. Um, okay, so that's all the time we have for Q&A. Tara wanted to um, talk about a couple of things, important things. A huge thank you to all of our panelists and everyone at GLSEN and all of you who participated today and asked questions. Um, I have sent a link in the chat for our evaluation. Um, this is required by our funder and it actually gives us an opportunity to receive and incorporate your feedback for our future trainings. It'll just take a few minutes of your time. Um, and once you complete the first evaluation, it will redirect you to a second, uh, another brief evaluation. Um, and um, if you'd like a certificate of completion after you complete those evaluations, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and thank you again for participating and we really appreciate your feedback. Thanks, everyone.